This presentation on regenerative agriculture is by Taylor Collins and was given to the Fredericksburg chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas, May 24, 2022. My name is Taylor Collins. Um, I'm going to give you guys a presentation on some topics that are near and dear to my heart, but I am a first generation rancher. I like to consider myself more of a land steward. And so it's, it's our jobs as ranchers and farmers to care for soil, to nourish ecosystems, not to degrade them and deplete them. And so I consider myself fortunate to co-create, co-collaborate and coexist on my ranch with my family. And so we are a multi-species regenerative ranch. We raise bison, we have 150 bison, the original North American soil builders, the architects of our most fertile food systems. They're pretty exciting if you can't tell. Uh, we do raise about 500 heritage breed turkeys every year, and we sell those for Thanksgiving, but they live out on the pastures, they, they roost in our trees, they're actually laying, nesting on clutches of eggs right now and hatching eggs left and right, which is pretty exciting to see that, baby turkeys all over the property. Um, and then we raise broiler chickens, laying chickens, we have heritage breed pigs on pasture year round, we have laying ducks. And then we have a honeybee apiary, but at any given point in time, we have 100,000 beating hearts in the form of native wildlife, uh, you know, migratory species, or even some invasive species that call our ecosystem home. And so just some things that we've been seeing recently. This last winter, we had a resident bald eagle on the property. We had a golden eagle that was on the property. We see great horned owls all the time. Last week, I saw a hognose snake, which was pretty fun. You know, ringtail cats are abundant at our ranch. We had mountain lions spotted out there. And, and the brilliant and beautiful part is all of those organisms have a place in our ecosystem. They've been here. Those species, for the most part, have been here longer than I have, longer than our, our human species has. And so they have a place at the table. We want to invite them to co-collaborate, co-participate in our ranch ecosystem. And so when we bought the property in 2017, we're, we're, man we're managing 900 acres right now. And we're east of Fredericksburg. So think like 290 headed towards Johnson City. Uh, not quite to Stonewall, but there's an old town called Blumenthal. Um, and so we're outside of Blumenthal, right along the Ferdinand River. And uh, 450 acres of our 900 acres was managed through conventional industrial agriculture. And so when we think about industrial agriculture, it's chemical and mechanical warfare against Mother Nature, right? And it's about creating cheap, and abundant food at the expense of all else. Um, and so this particular field had been farmed for over 100 years. That tree line down there, that's the Pertinales River. Uh, been farmed conventionally, monocultures for over 100 years. Post-World War II, you know, technology such as chemical herbicides, fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides were used on this field. And it was tilled every single year, multiple times a year. And so when we acquired the property, this is subsoil. All of our topsoil was eroded and all of our topsoil had been lost to the Pertinales. And so we did baseline soil monitoring. We were less than half a percent of organic matter. Historically, in this river valley, we should be about six, four to six percent organic matter in our soil. That's living organisms in our soil. That's carbon, that's structure, that's biodiversity. And so all of that was lost. And as first generation ranchers, when we bought the ranch, we, the first thing we did was we went out here and we broadcasted native perennial grassland seeds. And, and guess how many germinated? Maybe like one. <laughs> we had one plant. Like maybe it was like a like little blue stem. And okay, that was a $10,000 little blue stem. And I don't know if that was a good deal. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is that these native seeds didn't recognize this soil as native soil. Uh, the fungal network was gone. The biology was gone. So all the biological stimuluses that turn on those seeds and help them germinate were eliminated from the ecosystem. And there's a famous quote here that says, a nation who destroys its soil destroys itself. That's uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Oh man, can I give you guys a sneak peek? Uh, I'd like to challenge you right now to think, you know, what is the most destructive industry that humans have ever created? You know, a lot of times people think about that and they're like, oh, that's easy. You know, that's got to be like gas and oil extraction or some kind of mining, you know, uh, lumber extraction, right? But the fact is that agriculture has been the most destructive industry that humans have ever created since the starting of time. And just some statistics that really highlight that is every year in the United States, we lose 36 billion tons of topsoil. And so that is 
that field right there in most of the land mass in the United States. Uh, when you have flash flooding, when you have wind events, you get tons of erosion. That 36 billion tons, that has an economic value of a trillion dollars. That's insane. So we're just, all of our natural resources are being extracted. They go into streams, which go into rivers, which go into the Gulf of Mexico and create entire dead zones in the ocean. 5.6 billion pounds of chemicals are used in agriculture annually. And think about that's glyphosate, that's atrazine, that's 2,4-D. These are synthetic chemicals that are known carcinogens. So where in history did consumers and did farmers and ranchers think it'd be a good idea to spray poison directly onto our food, right? Um, we're about 8, million people, 8, 8 billion people globally on this planet. So that's almost a pound of carcinogenic <laughs> chemical per person on the planet, which is insane. We have glyphosate in breast milk of lactating mothers now. Glyphosate is detected in rainfall. And so these are unintended consequences of this chemical agricultural complex. Um, the other thing I want to point out, 20 million pounds of antibiotics are used annually in livestock. And that's a low number. That I've seen that number go all the way up to 60 million. It's kind of hard to quantify and to track. But regardless, 80% of our global usage of antibiotics is going to livestock. Right? And that's that's atrocious. And that's that's weak animals that are removed from their biological environments. That's animals that were bred for one reason, which is to get fat, fast, and cheaply, not to be resilient, not to have good immune systems, and not to produce nourishing food for consumers. And so you see you have all these unintended consequences with in, uh, conventional industrial chemical agriculture, right? And so again, the consequences like the loss of our topsoil, carbon emitting in the atmosphere, uh, climate change, you know, broken water systems, food insecurity. And one of, the, one of the unintended consequences of chemical industrial agriculture for me is the loss of this very passionate for myself is the loss of the family farm. So every year we lose about five to 10,000 family farms in the United States. And, and these are people's identities. These are multi-generation families that are losing their legacy. They're losing their heritage. Their communities are being lost. And, um, Agriculture should be the highest calling, right? These are people who are on land growing food for consumers to nourish your family so that you guys can pursue your passions. But, you know, these farmers, not only are they losing their farms, but they have some of the highest suicide rates out of any given profession, even higher than returning veterans from war, which is pretty crazy. Um, interestingly enough, while we're losing the family farm at an alarming rate in the United States, do you guys know who the largest farmland owner is nowadays bill gates so how about that so we're replacing these families and these legacies uh, with someone who comes from a technology background who knows nothing about farming nothing about land management right and so that's perpetuating our broken system that's using reductionist thinking and doubling down on things that aren't working like chemicals fungicides herbicides um pesticides you know there's plant-based laboratory, you know, meat alternatives. We're trying, there's, there's advocation for removing animals from landscapes. And so it's like we've, we've lost our minds, right? Humans are bad at thinking in holes. And this is thinking very linearly. It's very reductionist. I promise this gets more excited, more uh, optimistic. Just have to get a little dramatic at the start. Uh, okay, so you know this. What I'm talking about right now, the collapse of an ecosystem, the collapse of a civilization, has happened over 22 times. And so, think about the Mayans, the Incans, the Persians, uh, the Aztecs, right? This, the Greeks, the Romans. This has happened time and time again, where great civilizations, global superpowers, have risen and then collapsed due to the mismanagement of their natural resources. This is the first time, however, in history that we are a global civilization. Everyone is connected. And so the stakes are higher than ever. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention here is the FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization. It's a subset of the United Nations that studies agriculture. They have predicted that we have about 55 harvests left. So that's 55 more years of extractive agriculture where we're mining our natural resources to the point at which our soil can no longer produce food. And so we're kind of at this point in time where, you know, what are, what are our options? Our options are to double down on this industrial chemical complex. That's not working. 
that's a degraded model. We're going to just race toward the cliff if we stay on that trajectory. The other option is to embrace a more sustainable model. But when we think about how degraded our landscapes are and the de degradation of our rural communities and of our global health, why would we want to sustain a broken system, right? And so th then you kind of going up the ladder, and, you, and this is where regenerative comes into play. And so the regenerative model is where we can heal our landscapes, heal our communities, and heal our bodies through agriculture. And in large part, that's through biomimicry, and that's emulating Mother Nature. The architecture's in place. She's been co-creating and designing this for four and a half billion years, right? And so we're not going to get it better than her. This is in God's image how this system functions at a really high level. And so this is where regenerative agriculture comes into play. We have now, instead of unintended consequences that are detrimental to our land and our community and our health, we have things like an agricultural system that produces food while also sequestering carbon, while also infiltrating rainfall and recharging aquifers. This agricultural model can improve biodiversity, improve habitat for native species, you know, endangered species. Um, this is a win-win-win system. And uh, this is what we're doing at our ranch and what is happening right now with food at large. And again, this is it's, it's agroecology. It's, it's thinking about whole systems. It's thinking about ecosystems in place. And we're going to get into that a, a little bit more as we get through this presentation. But these are the six principles of soil health. This is like the meat and potatoes of, of the presentation. And this is really beautiful information that can be applied to all different contexts. So whether you, you know, you're on 900 acres in Fredericksburg, Texas, or 200,000 acres in New Mexico, 25 acres in Hawaii, these are soil health principles that are directly inspired and in lessons from Mother Nature. So we're going to uh, dive into each of these here. Okay, this says minimize mechanical, chemical, and biological disturbance of, of the ground. <laughs> Um, there's more living organisms in one tablespoon of healthy soil than all humans on the face of the planet since the starting of time. And so when you run a till through a field like this, or when you spray it with a, with a biocide, you're nuking that underground community, right? It's very dynamic. There's so much diversity. There's so much living organisms. We need to start seeing that soil, not as dirt. It's not geology waiting for us to impart our chemistry on it. This is biology. This is a living system. This system works. We need to keep it intact. Not to mention that till right there, a third of the atmospheric legacy carbon load is directly through tilling. And so, you know, soil is an amazing resource for capturing and sequestering atmospheric carbon and cycling it through that soil. But when we till it, when we spray it, when we expose it, that gets re-released into the atmosphere. So there's a lot of unintended consequences there. The second principle is to keep your soil covered. And so this is a fence line at Rome Ranch, our ranch. The, the right side is us, the left side is a neighbor. And you know, you just have to put yourself into like a biological context. So if you are a white-tailed deer, what side do you want to be on? If you're if you're uh, a field mouse, what side do you want to be on? If you're a snake, you know, it's very, very obvious. One of the most important reasons. To keep your soil covered is because you know like think of soil as uh, an organism and plants as the skin right it's armor it protects the soil and there's you know old prophets old wisdom ancient wisdom they call plants the mouth of the soil right without plants soil does not get fed it doesn't get hydrated it doesn't get the nutrients it needs to, to thrive and so that system on the left where all the plants have been removed that system is in complete dysfunction. That's moving towards desertification. All the ecosystem processes that Mother Nature has provided us in these lessons through the architecture through millennia are being shattered right there on the left side. Something interesting is in a field just like this, I can go out in August with a thermometer and I can put that thermometer into our soil where we have you know, no bare soil and that will read 85 degrees at the ground level. All I have to do is walk across that fence and do it on the other side, and it's 140 plus degrees on the same exact day. So think about, you know, if you're a bison, if you're a ground nesting bird, if you're uh, a mycorrhizal fungi or an earthworm, which side would you prefer to be on? You know, we cook our food, especially our meats, to certain internal temperatures to protect ourselves against potential pathogens. 
Well, we're indiscriminately cooking and killing all the biology in our soil when it's there like that. Now, I know you guys remember the snow apocalypse. That was like a very traumatic day for all of us Central Texas people. I did the same thermometer test on this very field. And this side of the field was 30% warmer than the left side. And so that, that was the difference between life and death. We had about 145 dead axis deer that froze to death on our ranch throughout that freeze period. We had um, only two white-tailed deer that died. But every single dead deer that we found was found on tilled soils with bare soil, uh, tilled fields with 100% bare soil, right? The third principle is to increase biodiversity. I think one of the, the worst things we ever did in farming and ranching was we separated farming and ranching. We separated the animals from the plants, right? We had specialists. So now it's like you're either a farmer and you plant monocultures or you're a rancher and you have livestock. But plants and animals coexist. They, they, they have co-created, co-evolved to produce our nourishing food systems. Um, biodiversity is key. Nowhere in Mother Nature will you... Nowhere in Mother Nature in a functioning ecosystem will you find a monoculture. Mother Nature abhors a monoculture. She'll do everything in her powers to resist a monoculture. And when you think of like the most beautiful places you've ever been in your life, maybe like incredible gardens or coral reefs or rainforests, it's teeming with life. Plant life, animal life, bird life, insect life. The key is life. Um, one of the one of my most favorite statistics to talk about is, you know, an example of biodiversity is for every undesirable insect species here in Central Texas, there should be about 1,400 predator species in a high-functioning ecosystem that would prey on it. And so what we've done through the use of insecticides, though, is we've reset that whole entire ecosystem. We've damaged it. And it's like the low secession ones are the undesirable ones that we don't want to deal with, right? And so the more diversity you can have, the more resilience you have, the more checks and balances you have within your system. Green growing plants year round. This is principle number four. Too many times in Central Texas, we think we have a growing season, which is the warm season, and then we have a non growing season. And it's very common to till a field, leave it bare during your non growing season. So you're kind of prepping it for seeding whenever you're about to do that in a couple months. But when you do that, you're missing all the power of photosynthesis. You're missing all the power of those green growing plants feeding your soil all the habitat that you could be creating. And so this is our ranch again. This is a fence line. So this is uh, our cool season cover crops on the right. And this would have been taking probably around April. And so this is a multi-species cover crop blend that we planted. We can grow more plants in Central Texas at our ranch in the winter than we can in the summer, just because of the heat. We get better rain, more consistent rain in the winter, and we get temperatures where it doesn't evaporate. So we get slow infiltration, slow percolation. And so growing season for us is year round, but we love growing grass in the cool season. And on the right hand side, um, this particular field on this day, we had, uh, you know, we talked about all those beating hearts that are part of our ranch in the form of wildlife. There's about 10,000 Eastern meadowlarks in this field on the right. And we have red winged blackbirds, we have yellow headed blackbirds, we have cattle egrets. I mean, they're, it's teeming with life, tons of snakes, tons of insects, tons of you know, field mice. It's just a beautiful, brilliant ecosystem. And, you know, let's talk about just backing up to, to what is photosynthesis. And this is like elementary school stuff. And I always get intimidated to explain it, but right, you have plants that are taking in carbon dioxide. And the plant says, thank you. It releases the O2, the oxygen back up for us to breathe. That's a nice uh, exchange. And then the C from that CO2 is carbon. And that C goes, whether it goes to regenerating root structure or it is invested in the plant blades. And then a little bit of that carbon is sacrificed through the root exudates in the form of carbohydrates or sugar to feed the biology. And that's like the currency. That's what keeps the biological engine under the ground working, right? And so that's where like all the exchanges happen between the protozoa and the fungi and the bacteria it's all based on that carbon currency. And so this particular field, we started off at less than half a percent of organic matter. It was, a, it was an old hay field. And right now, this field is at uh, 3% organic matter, which is really great. 
And, and, the, and the reason that organic matter is important is because for every 1% increase in organic matter you can build, you're able to hold 20,000 gallons of rain in a single acre. So you're creating a sponge in your soil, which is very relevant for Central Texas, where you know we had 28 inches of rain a year, but might not get rain for three months, and then we might get eight inches at a time in like two or three days. You have to capture, you have to utilize every little bit of that. And so healthy soil creates a sponge. Um, so it makes you more resistant, resilient in times of flash flood, but also in times of drought, because you're holding on to that moisture. 20,000 gallons of rain, that's about an inch of rain too. So for every 1% increase in organic matter, uh, an acre can hold another inch of rain. So when we first bought the property, we couldn't hold more than half an inch of rain. Anything over that was getting washed off. It's getting lost. Okay, the fifth principle is positive animal impact, specifically as it pertains to ruminant animals. So when you think about you know, North America, pre-Europeans, we had 60 to 80 million bison on our landscape. We had 30 million pronghorn sheep. We had something like 40 million elk. I mean, the plains were alive. And then when you think about the bird flocks that would follow, those were in the billions. And then when you think about the insect species, those are in the trillions. And so removing animals from landscapes, that's fighting the co-evolution of how our landscapes evolve. Our native plants need the bite of a ruminant animal. And so, you know, the, the ecological uh, services that bison provide us at our ranch is they have spade-shaped hooks. So every time that animal is walking, it is cutting into uh, the soil in a way that's actually aerating it. Um, it's allowing water to infiltrate. It's not a flat foot. Um, we do bison field harps at our ranch. And my favorite thing to do is show people that hook. And what you'll find in the hook is thousands of seeds. So every single time that animal is, is walking, it's seeding for us. This is the most brilliant seeding machine ever created. No technology could ever improve on this. And they also wallow, which means they love rolling on their back and then walking 100 yards and then wallowing again. And so they're constantly spreading seed. They're spreading pollen, spreading resources. So these, these things are walking, you know, increasers of biodiversity, of plant species. Now, the saliva in their mouth, the microbiome that's in their gut, that's rocket fuel for plants. When they bite a plant and then they get off that plant, that grass plant grows back stronger. And so we're not talking about overgrazing. We're talking about the appropriate grazing actually increases the plant's ability to recover. It puts stress on that plant in a way that it gets stronger over time. You have to account for the recovery, though. The other thing that these animals do terrifically is we, we can't eat grass, right? And so they can use the power of the sun in rainfall, and they can convert that to a nourishing food source that can feed our communities, right? And so these are keystone species. Uh, what, what goes in their mouth? You know, each of these animals, we have, um, when, when our animal units are about 100 animal units, we, we're putting down anywhere from 500 to 7,500 pounds of manure a day on our pasture. And the way that we emulate the biomimicry of mother nature and the big herds that once roamed in North America is we move our bison every day. Sometimes it's 12 hours. Sometimes at the very most, it'll be 48 hours in one pasture. And so what we're doing is we're reproducing that predator prey relationship where there would have been thousands of bison, even through Texas. I mean, they were all the way from Northern Canada to central Mexico and everywhere in between North America. So these are keystone species that should be here. And when we can keep them moving, we get all that positive animal impact. And then we make sure to give the land and the grasses the recovery they need to get stronger. And so depending on our pastures, like our native rangeland, where they're grazing switchgrass and Indian grass, that could be six months. It could be a year if it's a dry year. But if we're in areas that are improved grasses that we didn't plant like Klein grass or Tipton Bermuda, we can graze that every 21 days. And so there's some context there. But we'd like to get our animals 30,000 pounds per acre. So they're pretty tight. Um, and that, that makes them competitive for grazing. So you get really uniform grazing that way. If we don't, if we give them 200 acres at a time, they'll only eat their favorite foods and they'll overgraze certain plants and then undergraze other plants. And so we make it tight and we move them all the time. And then the sixth principle is, is to understand your context. And so this is your, ecological context, this is your religious context, your financial context, your quality of life, this all plays into soil health and your overall program. And so for me, 
when I when I think of Central Texas, you know, we're a myriad of, of ecosystems, right? It's kind of like a mosaic here. But our area where we're ranching would have been a savanna. Um, all farmland, all ranch land, all neighborhoods are hewn from ecosystems. We're either woodland, savannas, grasslands, you name it. And so you have to be in the right mindset for your context of what works. Um, and in our position, you know, like we like this would have been this is the Serengeti. And so you have so many ruminant animals moving up and down these brilliant savannah ecosystems. And so for us in Central Texas, it doesn't make sense to put a monoculture of corn. Right? That's not how nature co-evolved in this ecosystem for millennia. It's with large herds of ruminant animals. So we're going to take that tool, we're going to take that lesson, we're going to apply it. Now, when done right, we were we were fortunate enough to participate in a study called a life cycle assessment. And these life cycle assessments look at every single input that goes into producing a, a given amount of product. And so in our circumstance in the meat industry, it's a pound of meat. And through this management that we're doing through regenerative practices, through soil health principles, we're actually showing that with every pound of meat that comes off of a ranch managed like ours, that that pound is sequestering carbon. It is, it is capturing three and a half pounds of carbon equivalents. Um, now, the conventional beef model there on the left, that's for every pound of conventional beef you eat, that's 33 pounds of carbon emitted into the environment, emitted into the atmosphere. So that, that's unacceptable. And a lot of times, meat, protein gets a bad rep. People say it's too taxing on our environment. It demands too many resources. It contaminates water systems. But all those arguments are looking at that dysfunctional industrial feedlot system, that model. And what I'm talking about is something that's very different. So this is a regenerative model where we're using biomimicry. And we can produce a lot of food doing it this way, too. Uh, the meat alternatives, so Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger, I'm sure you all have heard of that. Those are right there. So for every pound of those um, meat substitutes or meat alternatives, uh, you're emitting four to three and a half pounds of carbon to atmosphere. So it's, it, it's shown. There's science. There's research. There's inputs that look at this entire system in a holistic way. When you're managing your land appropriately with grazing animals, there's no better nutrient dense food for a consumer, but also better for the land than that particular uh, food source. And kind of like I spoke about with context, it's you know looking at your ecological environment that your land was hewn from. And so for us, it's savanna, it's grassland where we're at, but other parts of Central Texas can be woodland or it could be shrubland. When you look into those systems that work and that function at a really high level, all of these cycles are present. And so your energy cycle is the ability to capture sunlight um, through photosynthesis, put carbon into the system, armor your soil. That's that green growing plant. When that's in place, you're capturing water because those roots break up the soil structure. Those roots allow water to infiltrate. Any of that plant matter that maybe is like an annual that's oxidizing above the ground, you know, if a bison or another animal doesn't eat it, they'll trample it. And that slows down water in a rainfall where it's not just rushing off a degraded field. And so that, that's the water cycle fixing that. Um, the mineral cycle is, you know, this is, this is interesting. When we look at food specifically, so my grandparents' generation, for every one orange that they would eat, this generation has to eat six oranges to get the same vitamins and minerals. Meat is the same. For every one pound of ground beef that my grandparents would eat, our generation has to eat two pounds to get the same vitamins and minerals. And when we look at human mineral deficiencies globally, we're looking at things like calcium, uh, selenium, magnesium, iron. I mean, you guys know this. This is all stuff that you guys are probably working with or facing with or have family members that are dealing with this. When you start testing our animals, so turkeys, chickens, bison, cow, sheep, they all have the same mineral deficiencies that we have. And then if you trace that back one level lower, you start testing the plants that are growing in our pastures. So the grasses and the forbs and the lagoons, well, they're all void of those same minerals. And the key is that those minerals are in our soil, but it's the biology that fixes them to the plant. And it's through that carbon exchange, that currency, where they're able to trade and they'll be able to get those minerals through Things like the fungal network and the protozoa and the earthworms. Now, I know I know you guys 
are probably more focused on the ecological part of this. And, you know, like I'm sold, you know, I get it. We're talking like grasslands, we're talking plants, we're talking about biodiversity. I'm all in. But a lot of the people that we speak with, they want to know the financial side of this, right? It has to make sense. It has to be able to provide food for their family and they have to be able to, to pay bills. And so this is really helpful to look at, but this is through um, conventional management in our area, 100 acres of field like this that would have traditionally been put in genetically modified corn. Um, it's about $1,000, $1,150 per acre of inputs. And so that's diesel, that's herbicides, that's fertilizer, that's the seed, that's all the equipment to bale or to harvest and then to move to market. So that's that's very expensive. So 100 acre field, you're looking at $115,000 investment annually, right? And and you're doing good. You're doing good. You're you're crushing it if you're getting $50 an acre. And so think about that. Think about the debt there and the borrowing from banks and putting everything on the line. I mean, there's no this, this shouldn't be a surprise while we're losing five to ten thousand family farms a year. A lot of times, you know, the people in charge don't want their kids to have this kind of stress in their life to be burdened with these uh, these responsibilities and these vulnerabilities. Pay is a little bit better, but it would be about a hundred thousand dollars a year to have all the equipment, all the inputs to do a field and pay. Um, but you're getting about a hundred dollars an acre if you're doing well. Oh, this is pretty good. Okay, so this is that field. We call this pasture the Pertinalis pasture. Uh, our 900 acres, when we bought it, there was four pastures on that property. And now we have over 100. So we have 100 different paddocks that we use. And so this is 2017. And then this was taken of the same field last week. And that's in a drought too. And so this is our cool season cover crop that was interseeded with warm season perennials that are just starting to wake up. And, and this is teeming with life right here. Um, and so again, if we're going to get quantitative about this, you know, there's a lot of improvements that we can look at with biology, with soil structure, organic matter. Um, but what I get really excited about is that we have a 200% increase in carrying capacity of our land. So since the time we bought our land, right now we are running over three times the recommended county average stocking density for animals. So we have more animals per acre, but we also have more grass per acre. We have more wildlife per acre. We have better rainfall infiltration per acre. And so that's because we're doing that high density grazing with sufficient recovery. We couldn't do it without the animals. The animals are the key to that system. And then these are the non-quantifiable things that inspire me and, and provide hope for my family and for our community, but it's, it's things like how do you quantify clean water in this system, right? Being able to drink from your well and know that that water is pure, clean air. Again, how nice is it to go outside and not have to worry about your neighbor spraying uh, glyphosate or, or atrazine, right? Nourishing food, to be able to feed ourselves, to not rely on the grocery store and global food shortages. It's just so, there's so much peace of mind with that. We love wildlife. We love just having a resilient family where we're not dependent on third parties. Um, the community that we can build within our little area is very inspiring. And then this is something that's really special, you know, that kind of just brings it home. But when we, when we bought the property, there was a creek on it called Cave Creek. And so many of you probably heard of Cave Creek. And it's interesting when I look at old historical maps of this area, like when the first Europeans started coming here, they, they mapped out three creeks. I mean, there's a lot of creeks in this area, but the three primary creeks were like Barron's Creek, Grave Creek, and Cave Creek. And when we bought the property, Cave Creek was irrelevant. It was, it was dry. And when we purchased it, you know, the previous landowner said, hey, you know, you'll maybe get two months of water in this creek annually. And it's during the wet season. And it's all like, you have to get a lot of rainfall and it has to wash off into the creek. And it's dirty. And you don't want anything to do with that. And what we've learned is, you know, through 450 acres of previous farmland, through managing for soil health, for improving the carbon of the soil, the organic matter being able to capture rainfall, we've made such a positive impact on the water levels of the aquifer that Cave Creek flows year round, which is absolutely stunning. Um, this, this is the creek where we see the mountain lion. 
This is the creek where at, at any given point in time, if you go on this creek at night, it's like you're in a zoo. I mean, it's the freaking wild west. I, I threatened my five-year-old daughter when she missed the hay. I said, she's going to camp out at the creek tonight. And that is how wild this place is. But it's, it's also so encouraging. And, it, and I love this idea that Mother Nature's capacity for healing is greater than our own capacity for ignorance. Right? And so we have the ability in a very short amount of time to right so many of our wrongs. And the rate at which we can do it is pretty tremendous. We used to think that it took 500 years to build an inch of topsoil. But through soil health management principles and regenerative agriculture, we have colleagues that are building inches in decades. And so that's like, for me, looking at, you know, a 200-year-old oak tree and saying, what if you could grow that oak tree in two years? That's the capacity for healing of our soil. One of the things, just to let you guys know, we do a lot of big events at the ranch, and these are things that we just really want our community to be involved in and just have people connect to their land, their natural resources, connect with their food. So we have tons of community events. We have about 3,000 people that come out every year, and we do some things uh, like conferences. We do regenerative ag boot camps where we teach these soil health principles. We do uh, you know, bison tours. The bison field harvest, and then our Thanksgiving turkey harvest is a really popular one where families come out and it's usually multiple generations, like grandma, mom, little kids. And, you know, for the turkey one, you start out with a living heritage bird. In many circumstances, these little kids want to catch their own. And these are kids who have never been confronted with death, right? They've always had blinders on. They've always outsourced the killing of their food for that grocery store convenience. And we give them the opportunity to reconnect with those primal instincts and we facilitate that process and it's a beautiful ceremony. It's like a rite of passage and there's tears, but they're tears of joy and connectedness and, and, and gratitude and reverence for these animals. And then those families get to take that meat, never frozen home, and they make bouquets and arrangements with all the feathers. So it's really special stuff. Definitely would encourage you guys to check out RomeRanch.com and just see kind of our events page. You guys get out there and see this stuff for yourself. Um, 450 acres of our property was old farmland, but the other 450 acres is native rangeland. And so we do have pretty incredible, stunning stands of, uh, this is all switchgrass along the creek. We have Indian grass in there and big blue stem, little blue stem. We're seeing Eastern gamma grass return. And so these are like these higher succession plants that we want all throughout the property. But in our farm field, it's so degraded that we're having to rebuild that fertility, rebuild the organic matter, put you know, get the pH levels right in the soil again to mimic what it would have been when these plants had survived and done really well in our ecosystem. And um, that's that's it. I, I'll leave you guys with the idea. We, we do, uh, you know, check out RomeRanch.com. That's our, our website. We also sell meat. We're at the farmer's market in town. We sell duck eggs. You know, all of our animals kind of talked a lot about bison, but every single one of our species has a role on the ranch. They all scratch some kind of ecological itch. And so our poultry animals, like our turkeys and our ducks and chickens, they're just our bugging machines. We never have to use insecticides because if we start seeing army worms or grasshoppers showing up in one area, we move all the poultry there and they, they go savage. I mean, these things are the closest living descendants of dinosaurs. And when we do our Thanksgiving turkey harvest, it's just like you open up the stomach and a thousand grasshoppers pop out. It's awesome. It's, it's amazing. Um, and, and so, yeah, we just, uh, we do, we sell meat, we sell eggs, and we, we even ship it all over the United States, too. And so, uh, that's, that's us, and that's the presentation I have for you guys, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you also have. Okay, yeah, why don't you go first? Um, I have a question. What is, how did you start the, and how across Actually, they, they plant. That's one. And two is um, how do you determine the percentage of organic matter? And the last one is what happens to the branch of the chicken Oh, those are awesome questions. Okay, I forgot to say, but we use a, a machine called a no till drill. And so we can plant cover crops. And we can interseed them into an existing pasture. So we don't disturb the soil biology. We don't disturb the other green growing plants. So when we seed, we'll put thousands of pounds of seeds in a field and you won't even know we seeded. Sometimes I can't even find the line that I just went in. 
And so it's a really great tool uh, called a no-till drill. The other idea of, of removing animals from our system, that would work for a little while, but eventually you would get so much above ground oxidized plant material that if you weren't knocking it back, you, you know, you have to use maybe some kind of mechanical tool like a tractor or a shredder, you would inhibit further growth. Um, and it would also be, you would have to use a lot of diesel to spread seeds, to increase that biodiversity, to move plant matter. Um, and so those, those animals as a part of the system are really important. But it's not to say that if you have a yard and you're like, well, I can't put a bison in my front yard. What do I do? There's other ways to get positive animal impact. And so, you know, like compost or manure from an animal is a really good way to cycle nutrients into your soil, feed your plants. You also do something like setting up a little bat house and then under the little bat house, just put a piece of cardboard where you're collecting guano and then spreading that guano on the plants that you're trying to really foster and give extra love to. Oh, if the organic matter we send, there's tons of different labs that will help you with that, but there's a great resource called the natural uh, NRCS, the natural resource conservation services, it's the government agency, they work for you. And if you, reach out to our local NRCS guy. Uh, he will come out to your place and teach you how to do it. He'll do it for you. Um, and so that's a really great resource, but we do it annually. Yeah. Yes. It's a good question. So, you know, you look for things like, um, there's, there's so much greenwashing at the grocery store and there's, almost labeled exhaustion where you're like, I'm just confused. I'm overwhelmed as a consumer, but you have to kind of revert to things like if you're buying chickens or pigs or turkeys, those are monogastric. So if you're reading a label that says vegetarian fed, that should be a warning because that means that animal was removed from its ecosystem and it wasn't allowed to, to feed itself in a diet that was biologically appropriate for that species. They're omnivores.